All right, let's go through this exercise. Um, yeah, so there's a few things in this proof that I'm going to sort of gloss over, but um, yeah. So basically what we're going to do is going to let G from, let's see here, so Rn to Rn be given by g of x is going to be x minus a and h is going to go from rn to r be given by are they doing like i think there's like a garbage truck outside so anyways, h of x is going to equal the absolute the absolute value of x or the oh wait, no, this is an rn, so it's a norm of x. Um so what do we know? Um by letting um delta equal epsilon you can prove that g and h are continuous. Okay, so what am I saying here? What I'm saying is that in order to be continuous, there's that limit definition of continuity, which means that um, for every single point, you can, for, um, let's see, what does it look like? The limit as x goes to a of f of x equals f of a. Um, a function is continuous if this thing holds for every single a in the space. And the way that you check this is that this limit thing is, it's equivalent to saying that for every, um, for any point a that you choose in the space, for every epsilon you gave give me, I can give you a delta such that whenever you choose an x value, which is within delta of x, no, any x value, which is within delta of a, then you can guarantee that f of x is within epsilon of f of a. And so typically with these types of problems, like we've seen previously, it's um, a lot of what you have to do is, given any arbitrary epsilon, you need to exhibit how you would choose delta in order to guarantee this condition. And for these problems, what you have to do is you have to let delta equal x epsilon because for example if you look at um, the function g of x uh, if you look at g of x minus g of a well g of x is just x minus a so this is going to be just x minus a minus wait does this make sense no um here we would have to do this um if the limit is b so x minus a minus b minus a equals, and then the a's would cancel and you'd get x minus b. And so this, if you have the distance between x and b be less than delta, then the distance between gx and gb is less than epsilon. Okay, and this is this would be for all b in whatever space. Um, so that's what I mean by choosing delta equal to epsilon is that your choice of delta, you just need to choose delta equal to epsilon. Because then this is, let's see here, so this is equal to delta, which we have chosen to be equal to epsilon. And so it's the case that this thing on the left here is less than or equal to epsilon because, well, it's equal to epsilon. Um, oh wait, no, no, no. This, this, uh, the distance between x and b is less than or equal to delta, which is equal to epsilon. But anyway, so that's the way that this type of exercise goes. Um, you can do the same thing for like uh, the absolute value function. Um, again, you use epsilon equal to delta, or no, you use delta equal to epsilon, blah, blah, blah. So I'm leaving out some details there, but that's something that you should be able to figure out. Okay, so G and H are continuous. So, F, Let's hear, so f is the absolute value of x minus a. So let's hear, h is taking the absolute value. 
and then x minus a is what you get from g. So f of x is equal to hog x. Well, it's equal to um, h of g of x. And so this means that f is continuous because compositions of continuous functions are continuous. Okay, so now what? So we want to prove that, okay, so since the set x and r are n such that x minus a is less than r, Let's see here, so how would we describe this using our function that we've chosen? Um, this would be equal to the, um, oh well this is actually a little tricky now that I think about it. So this is, uh, what would, how would we think of this? So we could think of this as the set of x in Rn such that f of x is less than r. All right, so here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna cheat a little bit because there's sort of a way that you should be able to do this problem. So the set of all points x in Rn such that f of x equal f of x is less than r, that's precisely the inverse image under f of the interval from 0 to r. And so why am I cheating here? So basically what we're going to do, we're going to consider the function f not from rn to r, but from rn to the sort of the right half of the real line. So all positive numbers greater, all real numbers greater than or equal to zero. So h goes to zero um, infinity, not including infinity, blah, blah, blah. Okay, so now f goes from rn to um, numbers greater than or real numbers greater than or equal to zero. So now the weird thing is that this sort of half open interval, it's uh, closed on the left hand side and open on the right hand side, is open in the topology on zero to infinity. So really, why did I, why did I say I'm like sort of cheating here? Is that the really the best way to do this exercise, or the, the the only real way that sort of makes any sort of sense to me, is to talk about um, the topology on this interval rather than the topology on all of R. And it looks like in this textbook at this point we haven't really talked about general topologies that much. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what I think about the way that this textbook is treating topology. I think it'd be better to sort of do it like it's done in Baby Rudin, where you really take some time, like you take an entire separate chapter to really go into some of the details on topology. And here, like most of this chapter is on topology stuff, but it's not it's, it's not really quite enough. It doesn't give you all the tools that you really need um, in order to think about these exercises in the way that I think you should be thinking about them. So maybe for this, the best thing would actually be to go to chapter or go to Baby Rudin and read whatever chapter they have on basic topology or start on uh, Munkers or Munkries, whoever it is, a bit. But basically what I'm saying here is this is open in the topology on zero infinity. So what this is called is, this is called a subspace topology. And um, so here's what we're, how we're going to find open sets. 
open sets in this uh, in this space are inter sections of open sets in R in uh, on just the real line intersections of those with this intervals with this interval so for example um, so how can we see that zero comma R is open in the topology on this interval um, one way to see that is that zero comma R okay so now that I've written this I'm going to erase it um, I hate when teachers do that like on the board and you're like taking notes and you don't write everything down in time and then you just completely just are lost but um, thankfully since this is a video you can just rewind it if you need it but anyways how do we write this so we can um, do, do, there's like uh, uncountably many ways to do this but you could just take 0 0 to R this is uh, just the open interval from negative 1 to R intersected with closed interval from 0 to infinity because uh, let's see here. So negative 1 goes to negative number, so you would start here and you would end here. And obviously the this set on the left here is an open interval, so it's an open subset of the real line. And the thing on the right is the thing that we can intersect with. Okay, so that was sort of our parenthetical note. So this thing is open in the topology on this space. So uh, this set this thing is the inverse image under a continuous function of an open set. And therefore, the set itself is open. And that's how you do this exercise. And that's the way that I think you should do this exercise. The fact that this exercise is included in this section makes me think that there's probably a really easy way to do this using the techniques in the um, that you've been exposed to so far. But um, those proofs, they, they'd probably look kind of clunky and they would probably involve like thinking about topology in ways that I don't think about topology and maybe ways that don't end up being useful once you start learning more of the tools that you get to work with with topology. But whatever the case, this is a proof of this exercise. And so we're good.